19-year-old Denise Nasland and 23-year-old Janice Ott disappear on a warm summer day at Lake Sammamish. Several witnesses told of a smooth-talking, good-looking young man named Ted. Heat was starting to come upon him. There were clues now. A guy named Ted, a VW, a composite sketch. Your coworkers brought over the sketch to show to you? Was it because they thought the sketch looked like Ted? Yes. There was something about it that just grabbed my attention. And there was just something about the jawline or something like that that made me think, wow, this is really weird. And you called Seattle police? Yeah, I called anonymously to a tip line that they had set up. There was something like 3,000 potential Teds who may or may not drive a Volkswagen, and he was one of them. But he had this terrific, spotless, clean record. You have to understand that detective work was organized in a very different way in the 70s. There was no DNA evidence. Police departments didn't even have fax machines, let alone the internet. When they had a profile of him, I brought up the similarities to him. I said, this guy's name's Ted, your name's Ted, this guy has a VW, you drive a VW, you know it's you. And he just laughed, no monkey, of course I would never do anything like that. And you didn't think it either. No. You were teasing him. I was teasing him. Did you ever ask Ted, are you concerned about the similarities? In the very beginning I asked him, I said, did you read this, do you know what they're saying? There's so many things here that people are going to be looking at you, kind of making a joke out of it. But once I started to worry, like, could this be true? I didn't feel safe bringing it up. I didn't want him to know what I was thinking. So was, you did feel fear? Well, I did, but it wasn't like I was afraid of him. I was kind of afraid of my own brain, just going over and over this. Bundy realized that if he wanted to keep killing, he was going to have to go somewhere where there was no investigation. He has the presence of mind to move from the Washington area to Utah. He used the excuse of going to the Utah Law School. He gave Liz the option of going with him, but he was probably delighted when she said, no, I want to stay in Seattle with my friends. Bunny left for Utah September 3rd, 1974. Within 12 or so hours, he would be murdering the Idaho hitchhiker. Bundy went to University of Utah School of Law. When I was there at the law school, I would have regular contact with Ted Bundy, and everyone liked him. There were periods of time when he was absent from class, and people would occasionally comment on that, oh, Ted's gone again. The first semester, he's in class three times. He's like a kid in a candy store. He upped it in, in Utah, and he killed around four women in, the, in just a matter of weeks. I threw away everything, the handcuffs, everything. I, I'd get mad at myself a few weeks later because I'd have to go out and buy another pair. I mean, it's not comical, but that's what would happen. Everything Bundy had within what is known as his murder kit, there were reasons behind it. The tire iron, the garage, and of course, gloves. The items there weren't there by chance. They all had a reason. They were all connected to murder. He said, I always tried to get rid of all, all the evidence that would put me to the crime. So that meant I had to restock my toolkit all the time. Bundy ran to the Mormon church as a kind of refuge kind of thing. That was his angle at that point. They didn't know he was a bad guy. I baptized Ted after we discussed the church with him and he made commitments. So we immediately started to invite him to our social events, parties, dinners. We chatted and had fun and played games. Are you still in daily contact with yes. Ted as he's in Utah? Yeah. We would talk on the phone a lot. It was just the Ted I knew. Nothing was amiss. It's actually not uncommon for serial killers to have, quote unquote, a normal life while they're violently killing people. Shortly after 7 o'clock on the evening of November the 8th, 1974, Carol DeRange parked a car in this parking lot at the Fashion Mall. Shortly after began what she now calls her personal nightmare. What makes the Carol DeRange abduction so pivotal 
is that she's the only one who ever got away from Bundy. She was approached by a man near Walden's bookstore. This man identified himself as Officer Roslin. And he said, do you drive a Camaro? She said, yes. He said, well, my partner is holding the suspect and this individual tried to get into the car. He said they would have to go down to the main Murray Police Department to sign a complaint. Right when I was in the car, I knew I had made a mistake. Suddenly, he just pulled the car over, and it kind of went up on the side of the curb. And that's when I started absolutely freaking out. I remember screaming at him, what are you doing? This isn't the police station. What are you doing? And I could tell he just changed. He stops the car, and he attacks her. She knows she's in the fight for her life, and he handcuffs the right wrist. But in the midst of this fight, when she's scratching at him and fighting, she gets the passenger door open, and she jumps out of the car. He came out after me, out the passenger side. I remember feeling a crowbar in his hand. He was trying to hit me over the head with it and struggling for a while. And then a car came along. I ran out into the street and just threw open their door and just jumped in on him. An elderly couple drove to Ranch to the Murray Police Station. The search for her abductor began. And so this is the first time we have an eyewitness of somebody who survives a Bundy attack. Sometimes the urges become such a compulsion that they can't control themselves. And that's when they make mistakes. His compulsion that day was so high, he had to kill somebody. The first one didn't work out. He's now frustrated. And so he goes to find a second victim. The teenager, Debbie Kent. My friend came back from Utah, and she said, I don't want to scare you, but it, it, it's happening down there now. The headlines of the missing women had stopped in Seattle when mm -hmm. Ted left, and they started in Utah yes. where he was. Yes. What did that feel like? Oh my God, like the bottom of my world was falling out. It's like, it's just too much of a coincidence. So I did call King County Police and I did meet with the detective. You know, it's one of the hardest things I've ever done. I gave them some pictures of him and they showed him to the best witness from Lake Sammamish. She pulled his picture out of the stack that the detective had given her. She said, no, he's too old and put it back in the stack. So you had cleared your conscience. The police have cleared him. I just need to put these fears aside. Mm -hmm. And so you didn't trust your own instincts. No, I knew him so well. Yeah, and she loved him so much. Everything had been so good. So this was just crazy. I think that Ted's girlfriend was very brave to call us. I think she called us in part out of fear, in part out of public duty, perhaps in part out of protecting herself. She had multiple contacts with the police. They did do some investigation, but it kept coming back, he's not your guy. At the same time, while he's committing new murders in Utah, the cops in the state of Washington are finding bones, and those bones are ultimately going to come back to haunt him. The heat is building up on him. Ted starts looking for a new killing field, Colorado. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.